Now more than ever, innovative technologies are fueling change and sparking new ways of thinking. Collaboration between corporations and startups is key to staying at the forefront of these trends. However, finding the right startups can be expensive, time-consuming, and ineffective. But Plug and Play is here to help. As a corporate partner, you will gain access to a whole ecosystem of innovation. Discover startups that meet your tech interests. Stay updated on the latest trends and network with industry peers. We will help you during every stage of your innovation journey, no matter where you are and where you want to go. Get in touch today. Okay, great. Welcome, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Hope you got really energized from that video, as energized as you can be being on Zoom. Uh, my name is Jennifer Thomas, and I am Managing uh, Director of Plug and Play Health. And welcome to uh, our very exciting day that we have planned for you today. We're so pleased to have you join us. Uh, let's get right to the agenda. All right, so we'll start in a few minutes with a trends presentation by our Senior Ventures Associate, Julianne Roseman. Uh, next will be a really great discussion with our two esteemed guests who are experts in understanding what's next as consumers take their health into their own hands. Uh, then we have our startup showcase where we have 20 of our startups that were in our spring accelerator program presenting their solutions. So stay tuned for all of those, very exciting. And then we'll announce our corporate innovation award winner this year. Um, and you'll have a chance to vote on the People's Choice Award for your favorite startup, so don't miss that. And then finally, this year, new to the platform, uh, we are giving you the ability to network with the startups and with one another. So please stick around for that. Very exciting, trying to make Zoom as interactive as possible. Uh, let's move to our team. We have a small but mighty team of six. Along with me, our team consists of Ava S. Gary, she's Senior Program Manager. Nathan Sundheimer, who is Program Manager in Corporate Development. Our Ventures team is Alex Tran, who is Principal. Julianne Roseman, Senior Ventures Associate. And Diego Arias Garcia, who's our Ventures Analyst. So we have a great team and you'll meet some of them today uh, on the program. Um, so our partners, we couldn't do this work without our amazing partners. Plug and Play Health has 16 partners located all across the country, a mix of health systems, pharmaceutical companies and industry. And just as a point of clarification, it's our anchor partners who help us choose the startups invited to participate in our accelerator program that you'll see today. Uh, we also have some new partners and uh, we couldn't be more excited to announce uh, new partners who have just joined us since the start of 2021. Welcome to PNG Ventures. They just joined us this past week. We're so very, very excited to be bringing their startup studio within PNG to our partner circle. Uh, also joining us, uh, East Post Road Ventures. They are the ventures arm of White Plains Hospital, uh, an award-winning and leading healthcare provider in Westchester County, just north of Manhattan. So pleased to have them join us as well. And then also Change Healthcare, a provider of revenue and payment cycle management and clinical information exchange solutions. They connect US healthcare systems all across the country. So they joined in March, welcome Change Healthcare. So uh, excited to have new partners. Let's go to our map slide. Um, Plug and Play Health is growing. We now have seven locations with dedicated health programs, two in the US, along with Munich, Abu Dhabi, Singapore, <clears throat> excuse me, Shanghai and Kyoto. And we work closely with our colleagues all across the globe uh, in these offices to make sure we support one another and collaborate. Since inception in 2015, we've accelerated 374 startups. We've made 100 investments uh, with about 16% of those just made in the last year. And Julianne will go over there's those for you. And we have 41 corporate partners now. So I just wanted to take a moment and say, uh, it's really been a fascinating 15 months uh, in healthcare. And uh, we were fortunate enough to even find new ways to connect to our partners and our startups and keep delivering on our vision to connect the world's best startups with our partners to help them bring innovation and technology to market faster. 
However, we notice that as challenging as 2020 was, 2021 has already been an unprecedented year in health and in the last six months jam-packed with firsts, uh, including triumph and tragedy, opportunity and cost. Uh, consider that three, uh, there's three approved COVID vaccinations that started to be administered worldwide, and yet we discovered huge disparities in the rollouts based on everything from supply chain, socioeconomics, population health, politics, vaccine hesitancy. Um, 2021 brought us a welcome drop in cases that we were really waiting for in order for hospitals to sort of get back some semblance of normalcy. But at, then at the same time, we saw these variants that powered COVID surges all across the world uh, and brought some countries to their knees still happening. And we saw digital health startups snatched up for hundreds of millions of dollars and even new $100 million funds pop up promising to invest only in healthcare. And then finally, a fourth vaccine with promising results. So if you think about the first that have happened, what we've learned at Plug and Play is that the trends are changing quickly. And we know that your topic areas of interest can even change week by week because of the unforeseen events, the evolution of how the pandemic is playing out. But honestly, we just remain so committed to staying with you through this and bringing useful knowledge and service so that both of our partners and our startups can achieve their goals to advance innovation and delivery of healthcare. So thank you so much for your time and being with us. Now I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Julianne Roseman, to enlighten on some trends that she's observed over the last six to eight months. Julianne. Thanks, Jennifer. Yes, I'm excited to share some trends today in healthcare based on our learnings at Plug and Play. But first I'd like to take a minute to recognize our investments. Uh, in the first half of the year, we've already been able to do 14 investments in the health space, bringing our total health portfolio to 100, which is an exciting milestone for plug and play. As you can see, we invest across therapeutic areas, whether that's allergy, eye health, uh, brain health, dermatology, cancer, as well as solutions that support the business of healthcare, data exchange and hospital workflow, care savings and value-based care contract solutions. Uh, if any of these topic areas are of interest to you or would like to learn more about these startups, please reach out and we'd be happy to talk more. In terms of trends, today's keynote is um, highlighting one of our biggest trends that we're noticing, consumer-driven healthcare. Uh, it's certainly been said before, but it's really, again, true for healthcare. There's never been more choice than today. Uh, patients now have embraced telemedicine in a way that um, you know, has been dreamed of for years. Um, and we're seeing startups go direct to consumer in a new way in healthcare. Um, patients still have unmet needs and they're willing to pay out of pocket to get solutions for their care and their needs. Um, the startups on the other hand are enjoying this direct consumer approach uh, because they get fast traction and product feedback so they can iterate um, and really refine what their work as well as make revenue, like I said, out of those out of pocket payments. And so they're, um, you know, they do have plans to get, you know, insurance reimbursement and, and build other B2B partnerships, but not as uh, quickly out of the gate as they have in the past. Um, healthcare is now moving into the community. I think we've all sort of learned through this pandemic that our health is with us every day. And so health needs to fit into your busy lifestyle. It may be delivered at home or at a provider's office, but it may be at the local pharmacy, a community center or place of worship, or even the barber shop. Um, and we can use those tools of a remote patient monitoring um, and digital diagnostics to bring that care wherever you are and wherever is convenient for the patient. At the same time, there's a big push for identity and culturally competent care. This is the idea that patients want providers that look like them, that have their same lived experiences and can really understand their life and provide care in a way that relates to that. Um, there is now a solution for everyone, I would say. Um, so whatever your affinity is, um, there's, there's a health startup for you. Um, and, and that's really kind of tying into that value-based care focus, which is a renewed focus. It's an exciting trend to see come back. Um, and not only is it around the contracting of paying for outcomes versus treatments, uh, but also considering the patient um, holistically and saying what needs to be provided so that that patient can complete their care plan uh, for example, if a patient doesn't have access to uh, healthy food in their neighborhood, it's going to be really difficult for them to get on that uh, diet to lower their blood pressure. Um, and so it's, it's beyond just traditional care um, and thinking through the whole life of a patient and, and how to have them live, live and build a healthy life. Of course, at Plug and Play, we're thrilled to um, continue our focus on digital therapeutics. 
um, which these startups, you know, digital therapeutics is a very uh, defined uh, uh, type of, of start of startup um, and solution. Um, so that most of those companies at the early stage start just as digital health tools that then can move into uh, digital medicines and digital therapeutics. Uh, but it's exciting to see more um, continue to build and develop. Um, and a lot of them focus on preventative med medicine solutions. And the goal there with digital therapeutics is, is to be prescribed by a doctor um, and, and provide care alongside um, other you know, uh, traditional treatments and, and other sort of therapies um, that really help patients get better uh, and stay healthy. So this is what we're seeing uh, right now for 2021 in the US and we'll keep you abreast of new uh, trends as they develop throughout the rest of the year. And I'm gonna turn it back to Jennifer to kick off our keynote to talk more about consumerism and healthcare. Great, thank you so much, Julianne. And I'd like to ask our panelists to turn on their video and microphone. And I'll do a little bit of an introduction. Thanks, Betsy and David. Uh, so great to have you here today. Um, so today we're gonna to talk about the new consumerism in healthcare. And uh, we have two esteemed panelists. First, we have Betsy Bluestone. She's Senior Director of Global Scouting and Partnerships for P&G Ventures. Betsy and her team partner with entrepreneurs, investors, and startups to discover and create consumer products, brands, businesses, and those that solve the needs of consumers um, in areas that are new to P&G. So uh, each of P&G Ventures' partnerships is unique. Uh, they will provide funding and access to P&G's experts. They'll provide resources, some capabilities to get partners in their technology uh, and to help them create their brand. Betsy has 20 plus years of experience in brand and sales management within P&G. And she's an experienced business leader with a track record of success across channels, geographies, billion dollar brands, startups and acquisitions. And finally, Betsy is dedicated to creating a world where all entrepreneurs have equal access to venture building resources. So welcome, Betsy. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. Sure, it's such a pleasure to have you and welcome as our brand new anchor partner in health. Thank you. All right, great. So David Gordon, uh, thanks for joining us today, David. Uh, David is head of investments at Long Live Ventures. And just a bit about Long Live, they're established in 2018. Uh, they're a consumer-oriented digital health fund that focuses on investments in early stage ventures that seek to address significant health and wellness issues that are capable of producing global impact. So David is a digital health pioneer and a tech veteran. Uh, he's been at the forefront of technology for some 25 years, holding senior positions at Intel, at Partner Communications Company, which is Orange Israel, and Elbit in areas such as strategic planning, product development, business development, and technology forecasting. Uh, David's created and managed research, innovation, and corporate venturing frameworks. And he was one of the founders of Partners, uh, a partner, excuse me, where he, for seven years, he managed its international business. And over the years, he's been involved in several startup ecosystems via entrepreneurship, investing, and mentoring. So David actually started his career out as a military officer, as a programmer and archaeologist, a very uh, a varied career, and he also spent a term as a journalist and served as a research fellow at the Institute for National Security Studies, uh, a prestigious Israeli think tank. Uh, David holds a BSc in uh, and, and master's degrees from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. So welcome, David. It's great to have you today. Thanks, Rowan. All right, thanks for joining us both. And let's just get right into the questions. We have such an exciting uh, um, set of questions here today. I can't wait to start. So it's pretty obvious that over the last 15 months, there's been this seismic shift in how people uh, and consumers approach their health care. As Julianne mentioned, it's really one of our biggest trends that we're seeing. But I'd love each of you to comment on why the consumer now feels so empowered uh, to drive their own health and wellness. And Betsy, um, maybe we'll start with you to give us a little insight there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's some really interesting things happening on you know, kind of multiple different places in the ecosystem. Um, for me, and, and having had a long career at P&G, what's happening in retail, I think is, is pretty interesting. And so if I just look across, you know, call it our top 14 retailers in, in the US, all of them are expanding their health focused product lineup. I mean, it is just um, a, a major focus uh, for them. They are 
uh, delivering on the consumer's need for convenience. So, I mean, certainly over, over the last 15, 18 months, that has been uh, of paramount importance. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting is just the, the retail clinics. And if you think about all of the ones that have popped up at, at, at Walgreens, at Walmart, at CVS, the, the wait times for those clinics are like half what they are at a, a physician's office. And, and consumers are getting the right amount of time with the provider to be able to figure out what's wrong with them. So I think there's some, some really interesting stuff there. The, the cost of services is less in store. Um, certainly people are looking for alternative solutions. So, you know, trying a, a less um, maybe a medical or prescription route for solutions to things like stress and focus and, and other things like that. So, so definitely a, a shift from a retail standpoint. And then I guess just as you, as you think about um, the importance of services um, within that, that retail environment. So um, we're seeing, you know, 30, 35% of the retail space now being dedicated to services versus product, which is, is, a, is a pretty major shift and, and I think is making a huge difference in, in it becoming a destination for, for consumers. Yeah, great. I, uh, we've seen now that CVS announced that, you know, quote, aisle four will be, or aisle seven, or whatever they uh, designate will be uh, mental health services. Yeah. So really seeing the shift there. Yeah, great. And David, you have, a, you have a very global view on this. I'd love to hear um, what you're seeing about why the consumer in, in other countries are feeling empowered. A absolutely. <laughs> so uh, one needs to... Uh, Realize that Long Adventures uh, organizing theme it has to do with the, the group that we belong to, the Hutchison's Group's major footprint in the drugstore space. They, the, the group operates more than 16,000 drugstores in 27 uh, markets across Europe and Asia, from the UK and Germany, Belgium and the Netherlands, all the way to China, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Philippines. So we have a very broad um, uh, view and it's striking how the trends. I think a lot of um, everything, basically, that Betsy mentioned, is 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 being related to in various ways. But of course, each geography has its own parameters. If I had to, <clears throat> excuse me, if I had to generalize the model, I'd say that in in the retail space and from from the point of view of the investments that we seek to. Uh, to um, enable consumer, uh, modern consumer health at these at the retail uh, uh, space, there are maybe three pillars or three trajectories that we try to follow. One is pretty simple and has been all over the place. It became pretty ob became pretty obvious in in COVID year, which was uh, you know how do we complement the the healthcare space? How does retail complement the healthcare system? Per geography, and 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 I must say we think mostly outside of the U.S. as opposed to uh, maybe uh, the previous um, an analysis. So there's complementing the the healthcare system, there's enriching the healthcare system, and there's disrupting the healthcare system, and that's where we'll come to the empowerment. So in complementing, you know, from vaccinations to to diagnostics, uh, we have health, um, we have nurse clinics. In, in Superdrug in the UK, we have uh, uh, lots of places, we have pharmacist consultancy. So, so all the things that healthcare system would like to do is, is usually does, but is now either too far, too remote from the consumer or uh, not, not enough resources to, to provide for the consumer. The, we see the drugstores, we see the pharmacies stepping in in various geographies and trying to provide you know, fill in the cracks and the seams and the gaps, and and we know that there are many. Uh, lots of them are because of the need. Lots of them are because of there's so much to offer, and the healthcare system has to, is breathless uh, trying to pursue all that. So that's the complementing side. The COVID year has shown very well that these, you know, the drugstores are the ones that stayed open. The drugstores are taking, you know, they're volunteering to do their their job, uh, and in that space, enriching the healthcare system is where. The, the consumer outpost, this point of care, which is a store, is really adding new, new points of value, whether it's you know, starting from education um, and, and uh, public health screening, but it, preventative medication, medicine, and of course, a lot of the traditional work around what the drugs are, are the drugs 
fit for you, personalization of, of treatment, uh, and um, uh, you know, are there any drug-related problems um, and uh, adherence management? And the big, the big frontier, the beauty is uh, in the empowerment side, which is that's what I call the disrupting, because the same way OTC drugs are have disrupted and will be disrupting, and the same way we're seeing in the U.S. especially, we're seeing the the direct to consumer slash OTC hearing aid wave is where the consumer will have their own choices and the consumer can generate a pull in the healthcare space that has never been there before. And we will see uh, a shift in, in how healthcare is provided thanks to those, uh, you know, thanks to that disruption where people really roles and functions and processes will actually change. We're, we're uh, fortunately or not, we're just at the beginning of that. Yeah, that's fascinating. And it's, and it's so interesting to know how different it is in other countries. You mentioned that in some countries there, there are no options. There are no other options. People don't have access to a provider. You know, the drugstore might be their first point of care. So fascinating. Good. And then um, I wanted to get into a little bit about who these consumers are. Like, how do you categorize them? Uh, who are they? I know, Betsy, you, you, you at, at PNG Ventures, are, you're very aware of your consumer. Maybe can you uh, comment on who, who's the empowered consumer? Sure. Um, so so PNG Ventures really is a startup studio inside Procter & Gamble. And there is absolutely nothing that is more important to the brand building that we do than being crystal clear on the problem that we are trying to solve and for whom. Um, and so um, we have historically been focused on, on urban millennials, aging boomers, and the rising uh, Chinese middle class. And I would I, you know, sort of think of those as, as kind of the... Uh, the, the first frontier as we're going out with the new businesses that we're, we're building and, and making sure that we're serving the needs of, of those consumers, largely because their needs are really dynamic um, and, and, and tons of change happening. Um, the other thing that I would say is that we have been really deliberate about future-proofing our businesses. And, and that means despite the fact that we've been focused on, on millennials and we've been focused on, on this sort of aging consumer, um, we, are, we are doing that check with Gen Z um, constantly. And, and we believe that that's really important to the progress of the brand and making sure that they are set up for success over the long haul. As you think about, um, as you think about Gen Z, you know, they're, they're the generation that generates, right? They are the can do if it's going to be, it's up to me, um, you know, organ, you know, uh, part of the, of the community. And um, so, you know, if you think about the fact that they have never known a world where there weren't the repercussions of, of climate change, they don't know a world where, you know, that, that wasn't post 9-11 or they didn't, they don't know a world where they didn't have access to absolutely everything, all information, um, you know, the, the impact uh, on sort of what they expect and, and what they, um, what they know about brands is really, is really different um, than what it's been in, in past generations. And I think what's interesting about that is when you think about the transparency and and um, things like that 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 consumer demands, they're actually the things that all of us want. Um, and so you know we kind of think about them as a as a torture test. Um, and and if you can if you can win with this consumer, you're likely to be able to win with others. And so you know thinking about about who we're focused on in that context, um, you know very clearly first, but then doing that check. With, uh, with Gen Z is really informing a lot of the businesses that we're building. Did you actually call that a torture test? Yes. Okay. All right, that's a new one. I haven't heard that, but that's, yes. that's Gen Z's role, I guess. Yep, yep, okay. yep. For those of us who have Gen Z children, um, we can attest to the fact that they are, in fact, the torture test. All right, yeah. Okay, great. And then, David, I'm sure it's like country by country in terms of consumer groups, but can you enlighten us a little uh, uh, on wh which consumer groups you think are driving this or how you define them? So, so the striking part, we, we tend to um, focus more on the, um, 
actually the more medical and healthcare uh, clinical value, if you like, well, rather than wellness products we, as a fund. Of course, the drug stores have the whole, the full range of, of products that one would, would imagine and they kind of complement. So the, the, the interesting thing I think is that the shelves, the shelves, the dedicated shelves are beginning to move from consumer categories uh, to medical departments, if you like. So you will find the shelf uh, for chronic disease man home management and the shelf, uh, I mean, there is a consumer category of post postmenopausal women uh, and, and that is relates to all the products. And we of course have digital health offerings in that space. Um, aging at home, uh, young adolescents, uh, parenting, all these are, thought now not only as a, like a segmentation exercise in the marketing department, but they also kind of are, are a reflection uh, of, the, of the medical departments that, that we, we try to uh, um, extract solutions from and, and uh, put them in the consumer space. I, I think the-, so the consumers can really self-identify when they go into the store knowing that hey i'm suffering from diabetes and i'm an, a sort of an aging consumer this is my this is my aisle right and again come in for the baby bottle you might end up leaving with some fascinating new sensors to test your the breast mm -hmm. uh breast milk yeah um i think there's a uh the striking part uh is the role that the consumer is going to take in pulling the system, um, we are going to see. I'm, as as you said in the beginning, I'm kind of a techie person, a digital person. Started as a digital person, then rather than a healthcare person. And the early adopter phenomena has driven many, many, you know, businesses from smartphone and iPods and all that. Uh, I need not uh, go into that, but having that uh, put into motion in the healthcare space is a fascinating phenomenon. People coming to their doctors and say, we want to use this, we, we paid for it, you know, and I, frankly speaking, I even found myself using uh, uh, a sensor that I paid quite a lot of money before it turned into to be reimbursable here in Israel where I live. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I actually did that exercise, not thinking about this panel at the time, but I went and demanded, I said, here, I'm saving money, please reimburse me for this. And it was a big fight on that. So. That type of consumer pool, which which our shelves can actually accelerate the, the shelves of our drugstores around the world, is but you know that's a driver that doesn't exist in yesterday's healthcare system. Mm -hmm. I think that's really interesting when you think about it, like the world of of at home diagnostics has absolutely exploded. And there's lots of different different reasons for that. But one of the things that I think is so fascinating is is that use of diagnostics to know if whatever treatment I'm doing is working. Um, and, and the way that that drives compliance and habit change and, and that loop back to the, to the doctor often to say, hey, you know, this is what I'm seeing about myself. I know my sleep is terrible because I'm, I'm, I'm tracking it every night. And, you know, you gave me this or that and, and it isn't working or it is working. And, and I, this cycle that has been created by all of, in large part, the, the digital components of, of being able to measure and track is, is causing a, just a, a, a total change in what the category looks like in store as well. I totally agree. I think the, the, the uh, continuous sensing revolution is only just begun, but the, the, the repercussions are going to be huge. Uh, you know, starting from consumption patterns and all the way down to clinical outcomes, because at the moment we think about the world, now the world can test its glucose 24 hours a day, but think about a world that can test blood pressure 24 hours a day, which is not defined in the medical system. So yeah. there'll be lots of new ways to uh, manage conditions and, and screen for conditions and prevent conditions and treat. Great. Thank you so much. I also wanted to quickly ask you, um, do you think that brand still, David, you had mentioned brand um, when talking about the consumers, do you think brand still matters to these consumers that are driving healthcare or is it more about convenience or um, quality? 
Well, I feel humbled in the presence of Betsy here that I think is more, more a brand person than, than myself, but I can say two things. One absolute yes, uh, brand matters because of the, I think because of the, the magnitude of the quantity of offerings that are out there. And uh, at least until uh, further notice, until there's some consolidation, and there will be consolidation, there are too many offerings out there. We need something to hang on to. Brands are never really that good, but uh, to, as, as, a, as, a, as a seal of approval in the medical space, but that's what, that's what consumers are used to be using. And to add another brand up over the brand, so our, I think our drugstore brands, again, are, are critical, again, in this space, because anything you can get out there on the web with an unknown source and no seal of approval is, will, in the healthcare space will see much more um, dubious or, or suspicious than something that could be sold by, say, our super drug or Roseman or Watson's uh, and in the U.S. CVS or Walgreens, people yeah. will tend to try more uh, things that are on the shelf of their, you know, their reliable um, source. Yeah. That's yeah. I mean, I, I think sort of the, the foundation of this is the crisis of trust um, that consumers have in, in general and whether that's, you know, distrust for, for, for media or for government or for whatever it is, I think that sort of seeps into all parts of, of our lives. But I, I think the good news as a, as a, a branding company um, is that, you know, when you look at what the trends are between 2019 and 2020, there was a double digit increase in the number of consumers who said that they trust the brands that they buy. Um, and, and so um, I think brands have kind of been able to, to elevate. Um, Edelman did a study where 81% of consumers said that because they feel personally more vulnerable, right? Whether that's about their, their health or their financial stability or their privacy or whatever it is that is making them feel vulnerable, um, that that has kind of elevated the reason why they trust uh, brands or the trust that they have with brands is so important to them, right? So there's, there is this, this, this safety amongst um, the brands that my mom used um, or, you know, things like that, that, that certainly have, have seeped into, into the, the consciousness. And then the other thing that I would say is in the health and hygiene space, just as I look over the last year at what has has happened, you know, it is, it's the, it's the Cloroxes, it's the brands that, you know, that people know and trust, it's the VIX, it's, it, you know, things like that, where consumers have been, they've gone back to the, the old standards that they know, you know, they know what they're going to get. And, and everybody is focused and, and will continue to be focused on sustainability and better for you brands and all of that kind of stuff. And that's important too. But what we saw in this last year was people really migrating back to the brands that they know and love and trust. So I think very much alive, at least in the in the, the consumer or CPG space. But David, then if we move over to uh, the investment angle, you know, consumers are trusting brands now, especially because they had such a vulnerable year. But you're looking at new ideas, new companies. Um, how much does sort of the consumer play into, you know, play a part as you're looking for investments? So for sure, for us, the as an investment uh, set of investment criteria, we uh, we look specifically for that spin. So our our uh, vantage point is skewed towards uh, those um, those offerings that that go to the consumer. And when I say go to the consumer, I mean that they try to address a, a, a problem that is, is a, a widespread scale uh, globally, usually um, recognized issue with recognized solutions, recognized uh, target audiences, and that also relies on to some degree on technology because after all we are in the, in the VC space. Um, I think lots of, uh, especially digital health but also, generally speaking, healthcare um, uh, startups qualify. Uh, they many, I'd say, maybe uh, one, one in every two 
startups that we see in the healthcare space that in general has a consumer health spin to it. They, they, it's in their slides somewhere. It is our role to make sure that that's real and, 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 that we're, and relevant because we only invest where we do to see the synergy. Uh, but so I think, I think more and more we'll be seeing people um, presenting that in their, in their strategy, in their go-to-market, thinking that the consumer pull is essential, that uh, not by bypassing essentially the regulatory uh, certification, but maybe uh, bypassing in the beginning the reimbursement system and addressing the out-of-pocket, the freebies, the premium uh, models. But generally speaking, lots of people will have a consumer, sometimes surprising consumer aspect to what they're doing. And uh, we try to latch onto that. That's great. And then Betsy, um, we heard David talk about sort of the, the, the retail store as, as, you know, so you could self-identify and go to that specific aisle. I know that you're looking at some very specific conditions can, or, or so, you know, sort of um, health states. Can you kind of talk about where you're focused at P&G Ventures? Yeah. So within Ventures, we are, we have a, a pretty broad set of spaces that we are, are working in. Those that are more concentrated in the wellness or, or self-care, we are definitely less healthcare and more self, uh, self-care um, from a ventures standpoint. But we've stood up a brand in women's health called Kindra, which is a, a menopause brand that I am incredibly proud of. Um, there are you know far too few offerings um, for the 51 percent of the population that either has gone through or will go through menopause and so we are addressing the myriad of symptoms that that consumer is um, is experiencing we're working in personal performance so things like stress um, mental acuity sleep um, things like that I mean I think uh, suffice to say that that if you can fix this, the world's sleep problems, it is the holy grail. Um, and so literally almost every space we are working in, sleep is a component of the, of the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, so a lot of effort uh, being spent there. And then the active aging space, I, I mentioned it, it earlier and David been talking about it as well. There are um, you know, massive needs that that consumer has. And as that consumer is, is more and more intentional and, and focused on being able to stay at home. Um, there are some, some big problems to solve that enable people to be independent. So we've got multiple projects happening in that space as well. Right, that's so great. And then I love your self-care as healthcare because I do think that once the system really starts to uh, work for consumers, that piece of it will then be more complementary or synergistic with the medical care. Um, that David was talking about. And David, I know that you're focused a little bit differently. Maybe you can share uh, what you're looking at, uh, which is, it, it's also self-care, but it's more medical based as well. Yeah, ab absolutely. So, so we do, um, our uh, stores in many places are associated or actually operate telemedicine services. So we're, we're interested in anything around that space, including automated triage, including uh, self-sensing or diagnosing devices, uh, definitely point of care diagnostics, home diagnostics, chronic condition management tools, aging, femtech, um, drug dispensing, uh, treatment adherence and drug adherence uh, medication for, for, you know, for multi-medicated patients. Uh, so a lot of things that pharmacies are doing today in a small scale and would we'll be doing more. And, and frankly speaking, we're, we're constantly looking for new spaces that, that, that drugstores can, you know, contribute. And uh, that could be an eyewear, hearing aids, dental care. Uh, all of these, of course, you can reflect, think of them just as the shelves. They're yep. always, they were always were there, but now we're talking about kind of medical things, sort of well certified in the U.S. It would be FDA, CMART. Uh, so these are important, uh, important to us, uh, and we're certainly entertaining lots of loads of startups on that space. And um, I think I think we're going to see um, as we move forward, maybe even this year towards next year, there's going to be a, a, I think there'll be a few changes in the landscape landscape 
which uh, I'm, I, I mentioned this also because we try to already act upon that. And one, you know, there's going to be a reality check. Uh, and that will, in, at least in two uh, obvious spaces, or maybe one is obvious, the business model, uh, people, there's, the gold rush does not take into consideration the business model, but more importantly, it doesn't always take care of the clinical workflow. Mm -hmm. People have great ideas, especially in digital therapeutics uh, that really don't fit. And, and no one in the, in the ecosystem is actually, see, I mean, besides the general idea, so there's going to be a certain shakedown. The data, the big data uh, hypothesis, is uh, getting uh, less and less space in the in the presentation. And, and more, most importantly, there's going to, we're going to see consolidation. So players in a certain space will slowly either vanish or or start playing the M and A's exercise. So I think so. We, we when we look at companies, we we're already thinking ahead. You know it, what what. What, what, how would they look at the end of the year and maybe during next year? Got it. And just a quick question too. We're, we're running so close to time, but I wanted to get this in. It was such a banner year in, in, uh, in investments for digital health. I'm assuming you, you expect that to continue. And then maybe what, what percent of consumer health companies would be you know, taking up that, uh, that trend? So I, I really don't think there'll be very few fewer consumer health companies out there. The, the, the border lines will not, are, not, are not clear cut. Every, I'm, but I think what we're trying to say here is that consumer health is, is an integrated part of most any offering out there. You know, I'm not talking about hospital technology and rare diseases, but almost every human condition that's widespread has, a consumer, has or will have a consumer aspect to that. And I think that's something that everyone should take into consideration. Great. And um, just, I want to get to a couple audience questions, and I know we're bumping up against time. Betsy, any other um, sort of salient points that uh, you are thinking about to get across on the panel? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would just say, you know, I think that that one of the other really interesting spaces is just, you know, how consumers are learning about things in this arena and how different that is um, than it was even five years ago, right? And, and you know, the, the question about, you know, how will people figure out what's for them and, and if they're spending less time at the doctor or, you know, whatever that is, if they're, they're trying, you know, direct to consumer brands and all of that kind of stuff in the, in the space, you know, how will they, how will they understand that? And I, I think it just, Kind of it, it it taps back into this this fact of it's the it's the I hate to say it it's the ratings and reviews it's word of mouth it's the credentialing it's all of that kind of stuff and how that comes together so that you're actually getting that support from you know from your physician um, you know you've got that oversight and is is really an interesting challenge I think for for brands and consumers alike and the convenience you mentioned that you think convenience will be the driver as well. No doubt about it. No, and I mean, after this last year of being able to do literally everything from your house, li literally yeah. everything from your house. I mean, I remember 18 months ago, I wanted my dermatologist to look at a spot from the picture and she, be, she laughed at me like, right. no, you have to have an appointment. You have to come in. Um, right. Think how far we've come. It's amazing what fear does to you. Right. <laughs> and David, if we get the convenience and doing everything from your home, just to quickly, um, what does that do with the retail stores? Will people still be, you know, uh, motivated to go in, you know, drive down the street or whatever to get the product? That's a great point because our stores are, and I, I just as an example, but I have like 27 markets of those. They're all online and offline. So the, the, the shelf is an integrated shelf. Uh, it's, it's kind of a technical detail, what goes only online or what goes only on the shelf. And that's, you know, healthcare category owners are, are, are working on that and, you know, shifting that around. So I think that's an asset, uh, but um, the, the, the beauty of having physical stores, especially in the digital, um, you know, marketplace is, is what, what is our job to, to leverage, right? And the fact that you have professionals that actually can see you, the fact that you can step in, the fact that you can maintain the human interaction, 
and combine that with an online play. That's that's where uh, you know thinking of physical retail or or hybrid models comes into play in a very big way. Yeah, I mean you can't forget in the in the U.S. at least, after nurses and doctors, the pharmacist is the most trusted professional. I mean that's that's a pretty amazing draw. And as David yeah. said, in some countries, you don't get to the nurse or the doctor. Yeah. Right. And, and we have yeah. like we have places like the UK where the, the authorities are actually, the NHS are actually trying to convince the pharmacists to take upon themselves more and more, you know, turn into somehow into like what you would understand as nurse practitioners, perhaps. And because it's just offloading the system and, and, and it's doable, it's kind of halfway to OTC, uh, if you like, or, or, or you know, self-care. We did have a question from the audience I wanted to share because it sort of gets to the point that, that both of you just made is that uh, the question sort of incorporates a statement. It seems like it's not just about the particular product, but the whole experience for the consumer around an area. Um, and is this the way that you can alternate the sell, the upsell, the deliver on broader brand experience around a need area? Yeah, I mean, I think certainly in the chronic conditions space, I mean, just, you know, sort of exploding in adjacent categories and, and um, you know, solutions that treat multiple symptom, symptoms in a particular space. So, so yeah, and, and I, I mean, I do think that that's one of the things that is done better in store than any place else. Um, certainly, for, you know, in comparison to a direct-to-consumer brand that only has, you know, a narrow offering. Um, and that I think that is one of the reasons why people will continue to go in store and shop retailer.coms and things like that, because you really can get more holistic solutions. Great. And then um, I also wanted to ask if you had any tips for startups, because we do have a lot of startups in the audience as well. David, did you want to go to a couple of yes, tips sure. for startups? Yeah, aside, aside from the, the point that I made, which was kind of a, a word of caution, you know, there, there are themes that are, have become stale. Yeah, we don't, while we don't need to be convinced that, that telemedicine is, is uh, uh, you know, that's big and you don't let it open door. And the idea that, you know, when we have an install base of a, a million uh uh, users, we will have loads of data, and we have we have loads of data. We will have great, valuable new insights uh, that nowadays needs to be much more substantiated, if at all. And sometimes it's it's not it's not sound to start with. So you might as well find the business of getting those what what business you can have while those getting those uh, installed base uh, uh, getting that install base established. So a, a little bit less of the big data. And again, beware of the shakedown. I think people are now, now that the storm is is kind of, uh, I wouldn't say it's over, but people understand it more and are, are, the panic is, is gone. People will be more selective. You'll need to have a reality check. And maybe finally, the again, the clinical workflow, which somehow overlaps with the, with the customer experience that we were talking about, that, that really has to be there for someone to be willing to use, adopt, a for it. Uh, maybe an additional final thing is there's always concern that you know the doctors, the system, the regulators will push back. What COVID year has shown us is that the this the current generation is 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 going through or has gone through the digital transformation. The doctors and patients alike were said when when people started to say, well, why don't we do this remotely? They're saying, of course, you have everything we do remotely. You know, why, why wouldn't we do it remotely? So all of a sudden, all those artificial uh, barriers went away. And regulators are always late by definition. That's fine. That has been that way with all technology, but they're they're ready. They're they're working on it. There there is openness, and and things will happen. That that is not will never be an excuse. Yeah. So interesting. And um, I do want to ask one more question that came in from the audience, um, if, uh, if we have time. And this is one of the ones we wanted to get to anyway, a little bit of the, the downside. Are there concerns or challenges with consumerism in healthcare? And, and could it radically improve healthcare? Or, or could it actually harm public health in any way? Um, let's see, I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on uh, some of those challenges. 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think the interest it, it's not it's not good enough for so many consumers. It's not good enough to be well anymore. People want to be optimized, um, right? And and so many of the startups that we're seeing in that self care space are all about you know, improving upon what's already good, which I think is, is, is really interesting. And I think it is synergistic um, with what's helping ha- happening from a healthcare perspective. Um, I'm not an expert on, you know, on sort of what the, the medical professions um, feedback or thoughts are on that. But from a consumer perspective, what I will say is people have gotten the idea that they need to be their own best advocates. Um, and I think there are going to be a range of solutions depending on the problem to be solved. There are going to be a range of solutions from things that I do that I, I pick myself and, and those that, that professionals are recommending for me. So I, I think it's, I think it's, it's um, increasingly more fluid um, and everyone's going to need to figure out how to play in that, in that space because that's what consumers want. Right. Any final thoughts, David? Yeah, I, I wanted to say that I thought that that observation of Betsy was is pretty interesting and exciting, actually. And I think that kind of portrays the the early adopter that I was looking for, the people that will start from people that can afford, that are, you know, well enough to think and be educated and select these, these and, and they'll be the early adopters that the rest of the crowd will be able to follow because they have tried. First. So I think I think that's a very interesting observation. Obviously, when we see it, it can also go on the macro level between markets, because we'll see how you know there'll be some markets that will be following others. Uh, in, in if you think, you know, throughout uh, say Europe and Asia in that sense. But I think that 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 is a very uh, smart observation. That that you know, if I, you, I would add a tip to think of down those lines to the to, to the startups as well. I think that be a good recommendation. Well, thank you both so much. This has been a fantastic, interesting discussion and we could go actually on for another hour, Um, but because we have to get to the startups, I just wanna thank you so much for joining us today and giving us your insights and wisdom on this topic. And uh, we did have more questions, but uh, hoping that uh, we can bring you back sometime soon. So thank you so much again for joining our summer summit. Thank you, thanks for having us. All right, it's been our pleasure. And I'm gonna pass it now over to our program managers. And we're gonna start with Nathan Sundheimer and kick us off to our uh, showcasing our startups. Take it away, Nathan. Great, thank you so much, Jennifer. And a huge thank you to uh, Betsy and David for the incredible and riveting conversation about the new consumerism in healthcare. I have no doubt this conversation will spark additional conversation about the role and power of the consumer moving forward. Uh, But with that, Uh, We will now move to the startup portion of our event where we will be featuring 20 incredibly innovative digital health startups who just completed Plug and Play Health Accelerator program. These startups cover stages going from pre-seed to series A and have come from geography stretching from the West Coast all the way to Eastern Europe. Every single one of these startups have been working tirelessly over the last three months to take their companies and solutions to the next level. And we could not be more proud of their accomplishments. And so today, each will present their cutting edge solutions and use cases on detection and diagnostics, telemedicine and remote patient monitoring, clinical trials, AI and analytics, and revenue cycle management. But however, before we hop into the presentations, I'd like to share a few announcements with you all, uh, with all of you in the audience. So first, we need your feedback. We are going to see some unbelievable presentations throughout the event today, and we want to know who is your favorite. At the conclusion of the final presentation, we'll be launching a poll. So please take a few seconds to tell us who you think should be winning the Startup People's Choice Award. We'll be announcing the winner shortly after the event. And I also encourage you to follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn to get a sneak preview of the winner before we make the grand announcement. Secondly, let's cover some quick attendify housekeeping before we dive, dive into the presentations. While we're streaming the event, On the right side of your screen, you'll be able to see who is online and watching the event with you at the same time. We encourage you to check out each other's profiles and please feel free to message each other directly to spark conversations. In addition, you are able to contact the startups directly. 
On the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see an icon titled Startup Booths. If there's a startup that ignites interest or you simply would like to learn more about the startup, here you will find additional information as well as contact information for their team. We encourage you to connect with each startup here today. And at the conclusion of the event today, we will be opening the floor for networking. As I've mentioned before, please feel free to toggle between the startup booths and other members of the audience using the Meet Now features. However, without further ado, we will now dive into our first category of startups, detection and diagnostics. To kick us off, we will have Vocalis Health and their CEO, Tal Wenderow, to tell us how they monitor patient health using vocal biomarkers. Tal, let's get us started. Hello everyone, I'm Tal Wendro, President and CEO of Ocalis Health. Thanks for the opportunity to be here with you. And I'm going to share with you how do you use voice to monitor health. We believe voice carries a lot of information about health. We all use that intuitively and ask, you don't sound so good. That's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to quantify and standardize the voice as a tool in the healthcare system. And what we believe is that you can use voice as the first line of defense in our path to move healthcare from being reactive to proactive. Obviously, quite frankly, we're biased, but we believe voice is the missing piece in the health management pre intra and post COVID with that transition into home base. But when you think about what our customers, what our patient really need, they want contactless and non-invasive solution, not to be connected to anything. They want to use it any place they want. And obviously they want it not only scalable, but really user friendly. And that's one of the characteristic of the voice that the ability to engage the user in his daily routine. And not only that, but also provide information, insight, and actionable about his health, whether it's to the caregiver, the user, or the provider. Our capabilities range between healthy living on the left side, through screening, symptoms, all the way to event prediction, and how do you predict an acute event within the chronic condition that you manage? If it, as you, for example, if you manage COPD, can you predict COPD exacerbation that we already have early data on that? But let's go one level down. Let's go to what vocal biomarker do we actually have? And just to make sure you guys follow, vocal biomarker is the algorithm we use to analyze your voice, acoustic only, not the content, and correlate that with a symptom, disease, or condition. And you can see here our vocal biomarker pipeline, and we can get later on if you have questions to a more specific vocal biomarker and which stage we are. But whether we have fatigue, that we have 85% AUC that we released earlier this month, alcohol intoxication or emotion, to risk screening for COVID-19, that is a CMOC cleared and released, pH that we're doing in, in conjunction with the Mayo Clinic, a shortness of breath, which is a CMOC, starting to look on AFib and other disease and condition, or vitality, which is a free speech that is indicative of the risk of a person, chronic patient, to be rehospitalized. And that's can use to triage our treatment to those patients. The way we deploy our solution is either it's a vocal biomarker platform, it's a SaaS that embedded in an API SDK into other app solution, whether it's a payer, providers, or consumer engagement tools, and our own disease management solution, most likely an app that we're building right now to really use voice to manage a disease end to end and provide that insight to that person to manage that disease with the unique capabilities of the voice. Here's an example if, with our Vocalis check screening tool for COVID-19. Uh, this is a back-to-work solution, but you can think about back-to-X, whether it's the uh, sports stadium, entertainment, and so forth. What we ask the user, if you see here, is to, is to come for 50 to 70. Very simple. We need 10 seconds of your voice. Then we load the voice to the cloud. We convert the voice to an image. All of our analysis and our AI engine is done on the spectrogram. And once you do that, we provide a score back to that user. And, and in this case, the score is low or high. Is your risk for COVID low and high? And then you can go test it or you can actually go back to work. And, it, and you can actually see the runtime is very intuitive and to take less than a minute and all you need is a smartphone or a computer or anything like that. We have a ton of momentum right now. And you can see on the left side, part of our asset, whether it's a number of people and patient, the recording, the vocal biomarker we have, 
We have a partnership with the Mayo Clinic, which is a shareholder of the company. We have a partnership uh, with a pharmaceutical T1 company. We are launching our product to COVID-19, which is obviously C Mark, and you can see a variety of medical condition that we have. And the sky is the limit. The more data we have, the better condition we can get, the better accuracy we can get. And, and I'll stop here for the sake of time, but what we have is a health platform. In the core, we have a voice computing company, and we have a voice platform that can be deployed anywhere. Happy to take any question, uh, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Great, thank you so much, Tal. Next, we have our portfolio company, Predictive, to share more about DNA-based digital twins. Sajung and Alex, the floor is yours. Predictive is the most advanced DNA-based digital twin to predict and prevent diseases and adverse drug reactions. I'm Sajung, CEO and co-founder of Predictive. My life mission is to save the most lives. My team members agree that the most effective way to do so is to save the savable lives. Every year, 55 million people die from serious diseases. However, 10% of these people, which is 5 to 6 million people every year, should have not died from it because these diseases their diseases were predictable and preventable. So this is why we built Predictive. Predictive is kind of a minority report for health. If you remember that movie, Tom Cruise using, uses a solution to predict crimes before they happen so he can prevent them. We're providing healthcare professionals exactly the same solution to predict diseases to prevent them before the symptoms appear. And to do that, we sequence your entire genome, 20,000 genes, which enables us to assess the level of risk on 16,000 diseases, simulate adverse drug reactions to 750 plus drugs. And we have a solution that is easy to use, that uh, is real time, searchable, and that evolves over time with you. Compared to other solutions on the market, we are the first fully automated solution, so we don't have to look manually at each invariance to identify specific diseases. We look at 100% of diseases known to have genetic components, we look at 100% of huge invariants, and we kind of match that, and that's the magic of bioinformatics. And that enables us also to provide a solution, one solution and four products, predicted for COVID, nutrition, so personalized nutrition recommendations, health, and of course, health plus nutrition, which is the most complete package. And that solution is, we provide it to healthcare professionals, but also retailers, especially for the nutrition part. And they will recommend or prescribe our solution to their patients. We'll do the extraction and the sequencing. We'll build the digital twin. And then we include also in the package a consultation with a genetic counselor. To do all that, we have been this amazing team with Sajung and Sijung, uh, actual twin brothers, myself, a uh, serial entrepreneur with two successful exits and a former partner at KPMG, Alexander Bresford, who's, our, uh, who's a full stack software engineer and who's our CTO, Mylani, our chief medical officer, she's an MD and Johns Hopkins bioinformatician trained and Shivam, our head of growth. We launched on the market in February and we've had already amazing traction with contracts covering over 200 hospitals, 3,300 physicians in nine countries, um, one major retailer, which is uh, online retailer, which is Quality of Life, a leading online retailer for vitamins and supplements. Today, we're expanding and looking for new business partners uh, distributors, but also, of course, telemedicine companies, hospitals, and we'd be more than happy to answer any question you may have. And thanks a lot for your time. Thank you so much, Alex and Sajung. That was such an awesome presentation. Now we have, have excuse me, next we have another portfolio company, Kit, and their CEO, Philip Fung. He'll be sharing more about their medical exam kits. Philip, take us away. 
Hi everyone, my name is Philip Fung and today I'd like to introduce to you KIT, the at-home health testing solution for healthcare providers. So what does KIT do? KIT gives providers and their patients a convenient and reliable alternative to the lab or phlebotomist visit. We'd like to think of ourselves as an Amazon for medical exams. A kit is mailed to the patient's home, the patient collects samples with the guidance of a smartphone, sends it back to our lab for processing, and then we send full lab results to the provider. Partnering with KIT has many advantages. Firstly, compliance is increased. In a post-COVID world where no one wants to go to a clinic or have a stranger come to the house to draw blood, we provide a contactless over-the-mail solution for patients to get tested. Secondly, patients are overall healthier. Regular lab testing enables a preventative monitoring model for the first time. Thirdly, patient retention is, is increased because lab testing keeps patients engaged with the system. This is a use case that several healthcare providers are very interested in using us for. Finally, there are lower costs. Since you no longer have to transfer patients to the lab or hire phlebotomists to go to patients and everything is done over the mail, things are more efficient, faster, and cheaper. Now I'd like to show you a preview of the patient experience for KIT. Welcome to KIT. State-of-the-art at-home health testing delivered to you. KIT provides you with the ability to complete the full yearly medical exam from the comfort of your own home without the need for a phlebotomist or lab visit. Our smartphone app provides step-by-step -step guidance throughout the user journey to make it simple and convenient. A blood pressure monitor is provided to measure systolic pressure, diastolic pressure, and pulse. A saliva kit is provided to detect smoking, substance abuse, and other risk factors. A scale is provided to measure a user's weight. A finger prick kit is provided to take a micro blood sample for testing all the common health markers such as kidney, heart, and liver function, as well as diabetes, HIV, and other diseases. Components used are proven instruments trusted by healthcare professionals. A live agent is available 24-7 to help ensure a successful user experience. KIT is here to help make health testing a modern, simple, and convenient process. Partner with KIT today to help enhance your remote patient care strategy. Now that you've seen the patient experience for KIT, I'd like to talk a little bit about the back-end process. KIT runs its own private CLIA lab, where unlike other labs, we only focus on over-the-mail lab testing. So we've developed unique IP to make sample collection easier and to provide diagnostic quality lab results. For example, our KIT is a full panel medical exam replacement, meaning we do 15 of the most common blood tests in a single finger prick. We're a young company, but we've already have a track record in the life insurance industry where several top insurers already use KIT as a replacement for the medical exam. In conclusion, at KIT, we're on a mission to make lab testing dramatically easier for both the patient and the provider. We think KIT can improve the quality of medical care and the business efficiency for providers. And we hope we can bring these benefits to your organization. Thank you, and don't hesitate to reach out if you'd like to learn more. Awesome, thank you so much, Philip. Next up, we have Peter Bianco, President and CEO of OsteoApp AI, and he is here to tell us about OsteoApp's powerful diagnostic tool. Pete, let's go. Hi, my name is Peter Bianco, and I'm President and CEO of OsteoApp AI, where we convert standard digital x-rays into a powerful osteoporosis diagnostic tool. The unmet need that we're addressing is currently the 75% of the 64 million people in the United States who have osteoporosis, osteopenia, or low bone mass, and don't realize it until they fall and break a bone. Bone fractures in the United States currently cost the U.S. healthcare system $19 billion, and it's growing at an unprecedented rate, which will reach $25 billion by the year 2025. This current rate is unsustainable to the health market, and uh, we have a technology that we think can address and find the 75% of those people with this condition before they actually fall and break a bone. We're a patient-centered predictive health company focused on early stage diagnosis and intervention for patients with osteoporosis. We convert standard digital x-rays into a powerful diagnostic tool 
using advanced network analytics to build better models for fracture risk assessment and deliver accurate data-driven insights for health systems, payers, and platform players. We have a transformative opportunity in this space. It's a large underserved market. We have a clinically validated solution. We have an experienced team. We're 510K cleared and CE marked. We have the ability to create a significant social impact with a novel technology that's been proven, clinically proven in Europe. We're positioned to become an early mover category killer. We are a spin-off of a publicly traded Swedish company. We have 510K cleared and CE marked and 25 active European sites currently. We have an automated uh, workflow and point of care risk assessment and large retrospective analytic capabilities. We're working with one of the major healthcare institutions in the world to expand the technology through artificial intelligence. We have recently concluded two successful pilots in the United States, and we now have distribution for this product with global reach. Now I'd like to show you how the system works and how easy and simple it is in the clinical environment. And that's the simplicity of the system and how it works in the clinic. Again, we have two uh, delivery methods. One is an easy point of care and workflow that integrates seamlessly into the clinical workflow. And our second application is that of a large series retrospective analytic capability to sort and look through large existing data sets and unlock the knowledge and, and revenue that is stored in a clinic's existing data stores. Our expansion beyond hand into uh, other parts of the body uh, in conjunction with a major medical center uh, using their data for training is going to take us through 2025 to all major parts of the body. We've assembled a world-class clinical team and management team, and we're ready to go for our series A, and I'd be happy to talk to anyone about that uh, at your convenience, thank you. Thank you very much, Pete. And next up, we have Evan Knox, CEO of D-Stroke, and he'll be sharing a little bit more about their automated clinical stroke detection solution. Evan, let's rock and roll. Imagine the following two scenarios. Scenario one, Mrs. Smith, you've been diagnosed with a stroke and you're being discharged today on aspirin. I want you to come back to the hospital if you have facial droop, slurred speech, or weakness on one side. Now, scenario two begins exactly the same, except the doctor says the following, Mrs. Smith, you're being discharged today after your stroke, and we're going to download the D-Stroke app, show you how to use it, perform a baseline test, and you can use this app to help look out for the signs of recurrent stroke, giving you the help that you need. Hi, my name is Evan Nock, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of D-Stroke and a board-certified neurologist. We all know which of the prior two scenarios is better for our patients. Stroke is the number one cause of severe disability in the U.S., with 800,000 strokes per year and an annual expenditure of $102 billion. Many of us know someone affected by stroke, but one in eight stroke patients will have a recurrent stroke in the first 90 days. Simply put, patients do not receive the medical care they need after their stroke. Our solution, D-Stroke, a mobile app that performs automated voice analysis, object recognition, speech analysis, and motion analysis using the same components as the physician administered exam in the ER with patent pending algorithms and a trademark in use. In our app, patients enter their demographic information and then answer the same questions that we asked them in the ER. One of these scenarios may be raising their arm for 10 seconds with the app showing them how to do that, as well as some responsive feedback telling them if the angle of their phone when raising their arm is adequate or not. In another scenario, Patients would smile and show their teeth with facial segmentation algorithms displayed on the phone or read sentences 
where the phone shows their sentences being in green if they get it correct, providing automated immediate feedback on their responses. They might get school reports like this one, which might show some minor abnormalities, prompting them to retake the test. Or in the case of major abnormalities, these results would get automatically transmitted to their emergency contact and also allow them to directly contact Telestroke or 911 from within the app. We have two great use scenarios for this app. One is in the pre-hospital stroke detection area because one out of four will have had a prior stroke, as well as the post-hospital stroke recovery area because stroke is the second highest contributor to disability adjusted life years, as well as ambulances and nursing homes who would benefit from the app. For our target market, we found that there's about a $10,000 difference in each CMI level associated with stroke severity. In this model, we could save potentially $10,000 for each decrease in stroke severity associated with getting to the hospital sooner, with payers being the hospitals and our insurance companies, and could be a licensed subscription and a reimbursable expense based on the below CPT codes. For our financials, we've achieved $50,000 in self-funding, allowing us to fund our pilot studies and are looking for $1 million in seed funding to get us to the FDA regulatory process in anticipation of 10,000 licenses and $5 million in revenue in 2024. Our team is composed of myself, a board certified neurologist, as well as our head of technology with five plus years of app development experience and our advisory board. Our current alliances are at New York Presbyterian while Cornell Medicine for an inpatient based stroke detection study and at the Burke Neurological Institute for an outpatient-based study on stroke monitoring. We've so far enrolled 50 patients in our wild Quinell study, achieved approval of our Burke stroke rehab study, and are in the process of submitting our application to the FDA for a 513G to determine our regulatory route. Our early pilot study results show that 100% of our stroke patients use their phones frequently throughout the day, that 70% use digital health apps, and that 80% would pay for a stroke detection app. Simply put, D-Stroke's benefits are clear. It's the first and only mobile app to support and educate stroke patients after discharge, allowing them to com communicate with healthcare providers and telemedicine networks. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Evan. Now we'll be hearing from Eight Chile and their CEO, Aravind Upadhyaya. Uh, Aravind, the floor is yours, thanks. Hi, I'm Arvind Padhyaya, founder and CEO of 8 Chili. We are a Bay Area-based medtech startup that is reimagining reality by developing the world's first training and collaboration platform that uses virtual teleportation. The Hint VR platform is powered by our patent-pending headband and an AI-powered content management system. The headband is powered by the industry's best stereo camera and a robust design. It can support existing surgical attachments that surgeons use in the operating room like surgical headlamps and loops. It weighs less than 100 grams and captures the surgeon's view of the procedure. It is disruptive but does not interrupt the current surgical workflow while capturing the surgeon's view in true interactive 3D. The Hint VR platform makes it easy for any healthcare professional to create quality 3D immersive content. Once the content is on the cloud, the AI part content management system enables segmentation and faster annotations. Finally, when the resident puts on a virtual reality headset like a HTC Vive or a Quest 2, they get teleported into the surgeon's perspective. They get to see exactly what the surgeon is uh, doing as a part of the procedure, uh, be able to overlay their hands, use the virtual instruments to understand the nuances of the surgical procedure. Our platform has received rave reviews from our first users and pilot locations. The only word that we have heard is relive the experience that has been consistent with all the users who have experienced the Hint VR platform. We have successfully proven our technology to eminent healthcare professionals 
at WVU Medicine, MSU Medicine and the Global Robotics Institute. We also have a very healthy pipeline of requests for uh, deployment of our training and collaboration platform. We have successfully raised a million dollars as a part of our seed round. Now we are looking to raise $10 million as a part of our Series A to bolster our growth and R&D activities. For any innovative idea to succeed, uh, you need a strong team. Uh, and I'm lucky to have Amit as a co-founder. Uh, Amit is a serial entrepreneur, has spent the last two decades uh, bringing multiple devices to 510K. Uh, I'm a technical founder. I've spent the last decade bringing concepts to market. Uh, and I'm supported by Mo Bharatan, who is the Chief Operating Officer with a wealth of experience uh, on the engineering and cloud and R&D side. And Abita, who brings in the, the flair for corporate relationships. Uh, and we are supported by a strong advisory team of surgeons who believe uh, in our product philosophy. At HGLE, we are excited to be a part of the plug and play ecosystem. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all uh, on the demo day. Thank you so much. Thanks. <coughs> Excuse me. Thanks, Arvind. Now we have Karen Marquez to show us how Robbie AI is preventing patient injuries related to falls. All right, guys, let's check out Robbie. One million patients fall in American hospitals every year. Every eight minutes, an adult dies from those falls. Falls and delirium-related complications are the second leading cause of death in adults 65 and over and add $300 billion in extra healthcare costs every year. But now, 90% of these falls are preventable with the Robbie Artificial Intelligence Solution. Robbie AI is the first ever computer vision AI system to prevent injuries related to falls and early prediction of delirium. With a proprietary data set of over 10 million subjects and a billion frames, Robbie AI has built revolutionary algorithms that combine real-time body pose estimation and automated facial expression recognition of over 30 mental states, including pain, confusion, and anxiety. Pair the Robbie AI solution with consumer cameras and you save lives, reduce workload on hospital staff, and save millions of dollars in patient costs. Robbie AI's real-time monitoring of mental states, level of pain, and body analytics alert staff to prevent serious falls and the early onset of delirium. Imagine a partner in your healthcare setting that always keeps a watchful eye on all of your patients. Robbie even sends push notifications to mobile devices when a patient is at risk. So there is no need for staff to constantly monitor the dashboard. In preclinical trials, Robbie AI was able to send notifications five minutes before an adverse event. Response rate by staff was under one minute. And 99% of falls were prevented. An average 400-bed hospital would see 282 fewer injuries and save between one and three million dollars, which is a 200% ROI. All you need is a Robbie box running the AI software and readily available consumer cameras. Robbie AI meets all privacy standards because it is HIPAA compliant. No video is ever stored and all data is de-identified. All Robbie AI does is prevent suffering and saves lives. The Robbie Artificial Intelligence, making the world a safer place. Visit Robbie.ai to learn more. Great, thank you so much. It was wonderful to learn a little bit more about Robbie. But now we have Ellington West, CEO of Sanavi Labs, and she'll tell us a little bit more about how she is helping detect and manage respiratory diseases. Ellington, take it away. Hello, my name is Ellington West. I am the CEO and co-founder of Sanavi Labs. Sanavi Labs is a medical device and software company that's harnessing the power of artificial intelligence to transform the way we detect, diagnose, and manage respiratory diseases. Respiratory diseases account for the most expensive and fatal conditions that we face as a global community. Yet there are no objective physiological tools for detecting and tracking these chronic and acute abnormalities. We're all familiar with blood pressure cuffs for patients with hypertension, glucose monitors for our diabetic patients, but when it comes to respiratory patients, they've just been counted out. 
until now. I'd like to introduce you to Felix. Felix is the world's first FDA cleared digital stethoscope that's intended for both patients and clinicians alike. All you have to do is place Felix on the chest of your on the on the chest of yourself or a patient, allow him to listen to the sounds of your lungs, and with the same accuracy as a trained physician, he will identify the presence of abnormalities and diagnose certain conditions. He then transmits that patient data from home or from a clinic to anywhere in the world. Now, while he is platform agnostic, we went ahead and created our own platform just to ensure ease of use and utility for both the clinicians and the patients. Now, Felix has a 95% accuracy rate in identifying these abnormalities. Physicians generally only agree 70% of the time when it comes to auscultation. So we're really working to help enhance clinical ability. So how did we get this 95% accuracy? Well, Felix was trained on over 13,000 patients in 10 countries on five continents, and we've created the largest pediatric respiratory database in the world. Now, while Felix is one device, he really can be useful in three specific markets. The main market that we're focusing on is the chronic respiratory patient. So the device would be prescribed by your physician and covered by a payer to ensure that you are not making those unnecessary trips to the emergency room when you step out of the lines of the parameters of your respiratory health. So instead of going to the ER, you would be notified and your physicians would be notified and your care team could then make an informed decision about what next steps should be. So we're looking at about $250 million in revenue by 2025, and that's done in a phased approach, where right now today we have the ability to operate with about $4.5 million in revenue in the next year or two. But once we validate in pneumonia, actually, which we already have, but I mean, submit and have that approval from the FDA, we'll be in a position to then open that market as well as asthma and COPD. Now, to date, we've raised about $3 million in seed funding, uh, $3 million in non-dilutive funding from NIH and NASA. We are gearing up for a $15 million Series A in September. And we have about 200,000 left um, in our seed round if you want to join in either now or at our A. When it comes to early companies uh, that are pre-revenue, I think a great sign of early traction is unsolicited interest from larger companies. So we have Philips, who's interested in white labeling the device, Johnson & Johnson, who we are a portfolio company of, who's looking to work on us with RSV trials. Our team is uniquely qualified to execute Execute. We have five PhDs among us, two MDs, the former dean of the engineering school at Johns Hopkins, and all of this technology comes out of Dr. James E. West's uh, lab. Dr. West has over 250 patents and was responsible for over $3 billion in revenue for AT&T based on one of his prior inventions. And Leslie Wise, who's leading our charge um, in reimbursement, she actually has taken three companies public on her reimbursement strategy, so we're in good hands. If you have any questions, I would love for you to reach out. Um, my email address is right below, and I would love to hear from you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Ellington. And that brings us to the end of our detection and diagnostic category. All I have to say is, wow, I hope you all are as, as jazzed and excited as, as I am. Don't forget that you can network with each of these startups later today. Now we will be transitioning to the next category of startups, telehealth and remote patient monitoring. Kicking off this session will be Visana Health and their CEO, Joe Connolly. Joe, let's get it rolling. Hi everyone, I'm Joe and I'm the founder and CEO of Visana Health and we're on a mission to transform care for women with gynecologic conditions. I started Visana after watching my mom, my grandma, and my aunt all suffer from gynecologic conditions. My mom had endometriosis that caused such severe pain that she would vomit. And yet when she would go to the doctor, she was unable to find a clinician who would believe the severity of her symptoms for 25 years. She'd often be told by doctors, everybody's period hurts, take some ibuprofen and tough it out. When she finally received a diagnosis, the only treatment option she was told was available to her was a hysterectomy. So that's what she had. And studies show that she's not alone. Instead of receiving early conservative treatment, as they should, women often encounter a decade-long diagnosis process and are told that surgery is the only option. In fact, 60% of women have surgery within one year diagnosis. This leads to a $40 billion problem in the United States alone. Through our internal claims analyses with payer partners, we've demonstrated that 20% of women have a claim for a chronic gynecologic condition every year. This drives three to 5% of total commercial medical plan spend. That's a very large amount. And over 50% of that spend is from potentially avoidable surgeries. 
What we're doing at Fasana is increasing access to best practice conservative care early in the disease course to reduce these costly downstream surgeries. We do this through three ways. First, through evidence-based programs based on evidence-based care from guidelines and designed by experts. And then we pair women with health coaches that hold them accountable to behavior changes that improve clinical outcomes. And lastly, we work with members to navigate them to in-network physicians that provide high value cost-effective care. In our results with patient advocates and clinicians at Mayo and other institutions show that our programs work. We're not only able to improve clinical outcomes, but we're also able to reduce patient reported interest in surgeries like hysterectomies. And qualitatively, users have just really reported a life-changing experience. They're improving their mental health, they're missing fewer days of work, and overall just having a better healthcare experience. And to illustrate this, one user said, I can't tell you how much my life has changed since I started this program. She started the sauna one week in the lockdown and she had pain so bad that she was unable to sleep. And she was able to become pain-free by using the sauna without ever having to see a clinician. And so we sell our programs directly to our customers who are the health plans and employers that are at financial risk for these unnecessary surgeries. And we sell through critical channel partners like PBMs and benefit consultants. We've worked with our current customers to create claims-based data-driven analyses that show that we can deliver up to a four to one ROI by reducing surgeries. And most importantly, we have validated traction with our customers. We're enrolling our first paid users now through signed health plan contracts and have a robust pipeline of payer interest. And our payer customers see more than just a financial ROI. They're looking to engage a critical yet underserved demographic reproductive age women, and they're looking to generate more employer sales. At Fasano, we believe that women's health is more than just fertility and maternity, and we are the only company working with payers to improve gynecologic care and reduce high cost avoidable gynecologic surgeries. So our ask, we'd love to partner with any employer, insurer, or benefit consultant that believes that women's health is a market differentiator. And we're kicking off a $2 million seed fund raise shortly. So if you're an investor interested in investing in a first moving category definer in a large underserved market with validated payer traction, please contact me. Thank you. And I look forward to your questions. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. Next, tuning in all the way from Paris, we have CEO Arnaud Rosier to tell us about Implicity's remote monitoring solution for cardiology team. The floor is yours, Arnaud. Hello, I'm Arnaud. I'm a physician and CEO and founder of Implicity. At Implicity, we use technology to enhance medical skills in order to scale the remote monitoring of patients. In cardiology, we already know since many years that remote monitoring of patients with pacemakers, implantable defibrillators, etc., is incredibly beneficial. It has shown that it decreased mortality while decreasing cost. And despite these huge benefits, and the fact it is mandatory to do it, it is reimbursed in many countries, adoption is actually very low. The reason for that is that it's a complete mess for healthcare professionals to do this monitoring. They have to connect to each vendor platform. They have to make sense of the data by using context of a patient from the EHR. And everything, of course, is done manually. After having worked on deep tech automation for 10 years, we built this team and we've developed the platform that all our customers want to use, which is a platform that gets all the discrete data from cardiac implants daily across tens of thousands of patients and all vendors. And using this platform that is sold to hospitals or third parties, our customers are able to basically monitor 10 times more patients with the same staff, but also to bill for this uh, reimbursed activity, which they usually don't very well. Uh, of course, using this SaaS model, we are able to remotely install and onboard our customers globally. 
we have been in the past two years able to become a European leader by installing 70 clinics from scratch, uh, build a, a team of 40 people, including our data science team to build additional algorithms, but also to install 13 hospitals in the US while it was not really planned yet. But there is a more exciting piece to this story. It is the fact that cardiac implants are really incredibly interesting when gathering data from physiologic data from cardiac patients. And most of these patients are already heart failure patients where prediction of adverse events is key. And of course, you need the clinical part of the story of this puzzle. We just got our hands on the largest data set worldwide, which is close to 4 million patients over 20 years. And we plan to use this to predict heart failure readmission in order to prevent it. Thus creating a compounded MRR over centers, patients, and additional features using medical device software. We are ready to scale in the US and we need the best partners to do so. So we are raising our Series A right now. Contact us if you want to be a part of this journey. Thank you. Thanks, Arnaud. I'm sorry for jumping the gun there. Uh, but now we have Maria Hahn of Nutrix to talk about how Nutrix is revolutionizing the future of glucose monitoring through their solution, G-Sense. Here we go. Hi, welcome. It's a pleasure to join this demo day and present our technology. Our mission is to promote the maximum well-being of patients with chronic diseases with the use of our non-invasive sensors. My name is Maria, and today it is my pleasure to present to you G-Sense. G-Sense is a non-invasive sensor platform that detects different biomarkers in saliva. We are using innovative single-use sensors for multiple indications, such as glucose monitoring for diabetes patients, cortisol monitoring for detection of chronic stress, and more indications as the platform was designed in the way that we can add additional sensors in the future. I'm James Vermar. I'll briefly describe what we have achieved so far. We have designed and developed a handheld pen-sized device for measuring glucose levels from saliva. The readout electronics and the exchangeable sensor strips are developed while keeping in mind the requirements of using saliva for point-of-care testing. The data recorded by the device can be stored on board or it can be transferred to a companion mobile app. With our current prototype, we can measure the glucose concentration in sub-millimolar range, which is much lower than the typical glucose concentrations present in the blood. We have also validated the detection of cortisol stress hormone in saliva that allows for detection of chronic stress at home. As to our next steps, we plan to launch our innovative G-Sense for glucose in Chile this year, our beachhead market. We plan to further improve algorithms and launch the cortisol sensor in the US next year. As to our recent success stories, we have close collaboration agreement with diabetes organization and also largest health insurance company in our beachhead market. We are now ready for launch with the multi-channel strategy. We will be selling our product as a service through our website and also largest pharmacy chain. To make this project successful, we have a great and diverse team. Jemish is a brilliant engineer with a PhD and numerous publications in the area of sensors for healthcare applications. Before founding Nutrix, he worked as R&D director. 
Nikhil and I met during MIT Bootcamp, where the original idea was born. Nikhil brings to the team his experience in customer goods design. What I really appreciate about Nikhil is his user centricity and creativity. As to myself, I bring to the team experience in medical devices development and commercialization on a global level. We count also with the support of AI engineers and manufacturing partners. We are looking to establish additional collaborations with experts and companies in diabetes, mental and preventive health. We are currently during our seed round. Please join us on this project. We have a strong team, great innovation and huge international market. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Maria. And now next up, we have CEO Tony Simon of Cognivive, and he will be sharing more about their digital therapeutics for neurological dysfunctions. Tony, let's rock and roll. 800,000 Americans suffer a stroke each year. Yet despite the expenditure of tens of billions of dollars in healthcare costs, barely one third recover enough to function independently. So why is that? It's because our patient standard of care is too brief, infrequent, and inaccessible to deliver extended, high intensity individualized treatment. That is what patients need in order to leverage the neuroplasticity available for reestablishing motor control and unimpaired cognition. Here we see the standard of care at an academic medical center. The patient's task is to put one soup can on top of another, but because he has no grip, the patient fails to execute the simple task. This is dispiriting and it's unmotivating. The therapist actually completes the action for him. This isn't scalable. And as a result, the patient exercises little neuromotor control of his affected arm. Cognivive's insight is that a unique scientific approach combined with low cost consumer technology can radically improve the speed and extent of patient's recovery. We've created highly motivating, completely personalized self-adapting treatments, which patients can self-administer at home and none of this requires a time or direct supervision of a clinician. In this Cognivive VR module, the target actions of picking up an object, transporting it, and placing it on another object are exactly the same as in the previous video. However, this time, the actions are now motivated by the desire to play a virtual reality game. Here, the patient selects a cannonball from either side of the body, retrieves it, and places it in the hopper. The cannon then launches the cannonball to where the patient is looking. The location of the cannonballs and hopper constantly change based on the patient's neuromotor skills. Since no grip is required at this point, the patient in the previous video will get extensive treatment on components of this activity. This kind of treatment can only be created by leveraging the power of virtual reality. According to evidence gathered in a study we recently published, patients enjoy using the system for 30 minutes a day, five days a week for several months and show measurable improvements. Cognivive VR is a unique home use treatment product thanks to several crucial components. They include spatiotemporal measurement of movement primitives and an AI that constantly adapts the challenge of each patient's ability level. All made possible by leveraging the power of immersive VR. Cognivive VR has been registered with the FDA for prescription rehabilitation in the clinic and at home, and our second generation product is designed to achieve breakthrough medical device status. 85% of the 800,000 annual U.S. stroke cases require treatment that Cognivive VR provides with its initial modules. Current low recovery rates leave 4 million Americans with chronic impairments that could be treated with Cognivive VR. Such a typical patient utilizes $14,000 of rehabilitation services each year. So, if Cognivive's durable medical equipment reduced that usage by 30%, an insurer covering just 2% of those lives could save over $276 million annually by adopting our solution. Our DME, comprised of Cognivive software as a medical device and off-the-shelf VR hardware, will be prescribed by neurologists or physiatrists. With approval as a breakthrough device, Medicare will guarantee four years of reimbursement while we gather evidence. This would generate at least $51 million of annual revenue from 10% of new cases. 
We will also sell Cognivide VR directly to patients and providers with a tiered pricing subscription model. Our market research indicates that patients would pay $50 a month to use Cognivide VR. Treating just 2.5% of the 4 million chronic cases generates an additional $60 million of annual revenue. We're seeking a range of partnership opportunities at this time, so if you're interested, please get in touch. We would love to hear from you. Great, thank you so much, Tony. And that brings us to the end of the telemedicine and remote patient monitoring category. For the second half of our presentations, I will now transfer us to my absolutely wonderful and superstar of a colleague, Ava Iscari. Take us from here, Ava. Wonderful, thank you. Hello, everybody, and thank you again, Nathan. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Ava Iscari, and I run the health program here in Silicon Valley. So before we kick off the next category, a few quick things. Um, out of the 20 startups that you're seeing today, we want to know the people's choice. So at the end of the startup pitches, we're going to be launching a poll where you can let us know who your favorite startup was, and we'll announce it very soon on our social media channels. So be sure to follow us uh, for those updates. We'll also be announcing our Corporate Innovation Award winner after the startup pitches today, so stay tuned for that as well. So with that, let's move on to the next category. We have three startups we're showcasing in the clinical trials category. So first up, we have Jerry, the CEO of Backdrop Health, talking about their breakthrough solution and outcome predictions and patient risk scoring. So take it away, Jerry. Healthcare spending in the US alone is about $4 trillion a year, almost 20% of the US economy. And there's a huge need and a great opportunity for solutions that can markedly improve human health while cutting the cost of healthcare quite dramatically. One of the best ways to do that would be to have a breakthrough in our ability to make precise, actionable medical outcome predictions and risk scoring about individual patients and populations. I'm Jerry Rudison, CEO of Backdrop Health, a startup which has done exactly that. The best way to do this would be to finally bring the full power of modern machine learning and AI techniques to bear on this treasure trove of data that we have in the form of modern electronic medical records and associated data. But you can't achieve the breakthrough just by aggregating EMRs. You can't achieve the breakthrough just by clever analytics on EMRs. You need a whole new way of computing on EMRs, and that's what Backdrop has done. The company's new, just launched last year, but their Backdrop team, working for over five years at the University of Utah, has created this technology, put it into production at the U, and we are commercializing it under license from the U. But I can't begin to do justice to the scientific and mathematical innovations in our approach, but I can talk about the two key elements of our solution. First is a piece of software called Code, our comorbidity discovery engine. Code takes any body of EMRs from hundreds of records to tens of millions of records and automatically discovers and quantifies every meaningful relationship among any and all clinical factors. The result is a vast comprehensive probabilistic knowledge graph called a backdrop, because once you have this, everything becomes visible in front of it. Nothing like this has ever been done, this level of precision or completeness ever before. Once you have a backdrop, you can then use HOPE, our health outcomes prediction engine, to make very precise, fully explainable, very quantifiable outcome predictions. And these thumbnails just show a small number of the queries we've already implemented. There'll be others as we address uh, given different target markets. So who needs these far more precise, actionable outcome predictions? Well, everybody. We see multiple big target markets, starting with pharma. There are about 7,500 drug trial teams in the US today who are seeking patients. Patient recruitment is one of the long poles in the tent for a drug trial and drug approval. It's expensive, time consuming, and by accelerating the process through using backdrop, by the deeper understanding we can provide of every patient who is being, being thought about for the cohort and managing a cohort more ardently, we can accelerate the cohort assembly, accelerate the trial start, and accelerate the trial completion. There's a huge win. Every day of lost revenue is 600K to $8 million a day for a blockbuster drug. Frontline healthcare is another huge market for us, shortening the diagnostic odyssey, avoiding errors, getting patients the interventions they need when they need them. And finally, insurers and payers have their own internal data sources, billing data, claims data, and patient demographics. We can analyze that in the same way and give them the ability to manage their plan costs while optimizing patient health far more adroitly than ever before. Backdrop is created at the University of Utah, and we had access to millions of patient records there, but we didn't make those available through the company. We're not licensing EMRs, we don't provide EMRs, 
We use those to build the best solution available so that anybody anywhere with a set of EMRs that they need to understand can get maximum predictive value from them. We've also solved the privacy problem. There's no PHI risk in creating using a backdrop and our solution is very flexible in content and format and very resilient in the face of ugly or missing or badly curated data, which is still common in EMRs today. We have a superb team, the technical team being led by our founder and chief science officer, Professor Mark Yandel. He's a brilliant geneticist and brilliant scientist. This is the third company formed to commercialize his work. I'm MIT undergrad, UCLA grad school, four times CEO of venture-backed startups. We have a transformative solution ready for funding for commercial rollout. We'd like to get two to three million to provide the runway to win and complete the first few paid pilots. Ideally, get a series A of eight to 10 million to go faster, but either way, we're gonna build a great company that can achieve wonderful things. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Jerry. So up next, we have another one of our portfolio companies. So this was a recent investment of plug and plays. So up next, we have Vertonomy presenting their virtual, solution, virtual patients uh, solution for clinical trials. So Simon, take it away. Hello everyone, I'm Simon Sontag, CEO and co-founder of Autonomy. Our mission is to end the use of animals and humans for medical device testing by utilizing our data-driven virtual patients. The status quo of medical device testing looks like this. Ethically questionable animal trials and highly risky human trials. These are associated with tremendously increasing costs and drugs expose many patients to unproven therapies. This status quo is not sustainable anymore. Besides the conventional regulatory tools, a new era has emerged within the last years, the so-called in silico testing. Currently, simulation plays a small role in the process. However, the American Food and Drug Administration is predicting that within the next five years, over 40% of the regulatory process will be covered by virtual patients and simulation. And this is exactly the market we are targeting at. Talking about the market, the global clinical trial market can be estimated to grow to 69 billion US dollars by 2025. This results in an estimated global virtual trial market of about 30 billion US dollars within the same time frame. Our solution is a cloud-based SS system to perform these virtual trials. Here by thousands of imaging data, pathology data, and data about a medical device is incorporated in the system. The clinical trial can then be performed easily and finished fast. The results are statistically evaluated, three-dimensional visualization becomes possible, and the reporting can be fully automized. The whole platform is AI-driven. We're developing a novel visualization concept, and the application is fast, safe, and affordable without any consequences for the human and animal. Our customers are medical device manufacturers, clinical research organizations, and testing facilities. By paying a subscription fee, they get access to the platform. On the other hand, hospitals are our collaborating partners. We incentivize them to provide us with data that is driving our system. Our software can be applied throughout the whole product lifecycle, from concept phase, preclinical tests using animals, and clinical trials, thereby using virtual patients as digital evidence to replace clinical evidence where possible. And this is not just an idea but we have already proven our market fit with eight paying customers so far using our MVP. Based on this early experience and customer feedback, we are estimating that we can reduce the costs during design phase by up to 60%, reduce the number of animal tests by up to 40%, and clinical trials by up to 50%. Looking at the competitor landscape, there are companies that are using mechanical simulations to perform virtual benchtop testing. On the other hand, there are companies that are data and population driven. However, we are the only company that is combining both fields. All this is only possible with an A-level team. Our management has many years of experience in the medical device industry, deep learning, image processing, software development, and entrepreneurship. In addition, we have a growing software development team with various skill sets. Our advisory board consists of clinical and strategic partners. In 2019, we have developed our MVP and shown the proof of concept with eight paying clients. Beginning of last year, we raised our pre-seed investment to fund development to release the first version of our SS system in Q1 this year. We are currently raising our seed investment to add additional features to our system, 
get FDA qualification, scale the market share, and become market leaders in digitizing, preclinical, and clinical trials. Thank you very much. Wonderful, and thank you to the Vertonomy team. So up next, we have BlockCube. Uh, so this is the last startup in our clinical trials, trials category. We have Rama, the CEO of BlockCube, presenting their clinical trials management solution that uses blockchain. My name is Rama, I'm from BlockCube. Our mission is to accelerate clinical trials. Let me show you a demo of our system that allows to do exactly that. Uh, our system is basically running on an iPad cloud and distributed ledger. And one of the first things that I'd like to show you is our informed consent screen, which is running with an audio as well as a written consent. The reason for this is the fact that there will be people who may not have English as their natural language or maybe illiterate, and therefore you would like to have an audio consent also. In addition to this, there's the standard signatures and one-time password that is done. Our case report form is gathering the data and it is an end-to-end -end transparency and you can see it is there in all steps of the way. There's an integrated finance module that makes a huge difference because it can tell you not just the accounting treatment, but also the budget and actual that take place. Trial master files are kept in the same system. Comprehensive audit trails also exist. A view configurable dashboard is there which tells us how much is the A and S E events not to mention the geographical situation that is existing across over here. I want to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we have in terms of the operational process, which today the pandemic world is not going to accept. And on top of it, we are having situations with ransomware attacks. And there have been clinical trial software companies that have been affected also like this. These operational inefficiencies are very expensive and can hurt us to the extent of $8 million per day. So as you've seen with the demo, our value proposition is different. We are able to accelerate trials and revenues, deliver real-time data, and reduce the vulnerability to ransomware attacks. And this is a fully decentralized patient-centric solution. The TAM is large, 16 billion by 2027, 13.6% growth every year. But we are being very careful and focusing on the early adopters that are there, geographically, phase-wise, type of disease. And our customers are really the clinical operations folks. We will work with an annual license, move to an SaaS, work with contract teams and our own teams, and look at direct channels, indirect channels, and government bids. On the left-hand side of the screen, where you see the future areas of growth that are possible, that will allow us to reach our ambitions of becoming a star right, from tokenized antibody assets down to existing phase three trials. We are mindful of our competition, but we have a fully decentralized system. We have a finance model. All this is put together with a patent pending structure. So not only do we do what others do, but we do even more. Strong pilot market validation, you know, 150 patients in 12 days. Sales funnels are looking bright. We are cautiously optimistic of what will happen. We have signed three MOUs. We're having active negotiations. And so we are basically hoping to meet both this year and next year's targets. Our competitive edge remains our team. It is dominated by experts. We are domain experts who know domain problems and have chosen technical tools to solve them. Our ask is simple. Pilot us, contact me for our pioneer program and invest in us with the 3 million C that is going. And why us? Because we cover all the stakeholders with some key value adds. We are a scalable health tech company. This is a market growing in double digits. And Science37 and Medabel have shown that this domain is very, very viable. And we can be a talking acquisition for others. Our seed round is targeting 3 million. 70% of it is going to be used for organization capability build and customer acquisition. We want to target our 70 million sales by 2026, 2027. And if you have any questions, join me in the breakout room. Fundamentally, we don't want to build faster horses. We want to disrupt the way we do clinical trials for today and for tomorrow. Thank you for your time. Great, thank you, Rama. 
Um, so now let's dive into our last category, which is AI analytics and revenue cycle management. So first up, we have another one of our portfolio companies, Hyfe, which runs an AI that analyzes coughs. <coughs> Excuse me. When you go to your doctor with a respiratory issue, one of the first things she'll ask is if you have a cough. And when you answer with a yes or a no, you've just taken an incredibly rich source of longitudinal acoustic health data and reduced it to a simplistic binary variable. Basically, you've just thrown away massive amounts of useful, actionable data. You can't tell your doctor what your cough is like because you simply don't know. And even if you could quantify your coughing and describe its acoustic characteristics, your doctor wouldn't even know what to do with that information because nobody has ever systematically collected hundreds of thousands of cough sounds and used them to understand what diseases sound like, except for us. You see, just as a disease can have a unique visual signature, which can be detected in an x-ray, or a unique chemical signature detectable in a blood sample or a throat swab, diseases also have a unique acoustic signature detectable in coughs. And the big opportunity in sound is that everyone is already carrying the testing device around in their pocket. Acoustic epidemiology is going to be a game changer. And it's a game changer because it comes at just the right time. Mobile health is changing the way people interact with providers. The explosion in healthcare costs is pushing the entire industry towards prevention and rapid diagnosis. And the huge amounts of data we are generating represent this massive opportunity. And at the center of these trends is diagnostics. You see the respiratory disease diagnostics and care market, it's just moments away from massive disruption. So the disruption of this huge industry is inevitable. And the question is just who is going to get there first? The disruptors are going to be those who can diagnose cheaply, diagnose quickly by eliminating the middlemen and replacing these artisanal processes with automated ones, those who can expand access, and those who can diagnose and monitor remotely. And that's us. Hyfe is an artificial intelligence platform that uses sound, coughing, to diagnose and monitor respiratory conditions for anyone with a smartphone. We're on the market already. Anyone can track their coughs over time using our Android or iPhone apps, and we've got a researcher-specific app as well. And playing in both the research and the consumer worlds has allowed us to amass the world's largest data set of cough sounds. We've used our massive database then to train diagnostic models for four diseases, TB, pertussis, CRU, and COVID-19. We are unique in that our diagnostic methods do not require the patient or the user to do anything they wouldn't already do. That is, we diagnose by listening to real life and our algorithms are trained on real life sounds, not elicited sounds. It means we can collect way more data than our competitors. We're not getting one or two samples per person. Since we're doing ambient ongoing listening, we're able to get hundreds or even thousands of coughs from one person with one specific disease. Even though diagnostics is a hard industry to crack into due to regulatory hurdles, we're already offering significant value to practitioners and researchers by just quantifying coughs frequency in real time in real populations with real diseases. Let's take an example. These are hourly coughs of our participant in a study we have ongoing in Navarra, Spain. This participant was diagnosed with COVID-19 on February 9th. Now, there are two things that are worth your attention here. First, this patient coughed 12 times during the first hour after going to bed on the night of February 6th, days before she was diagnosed. And second, she did not report having cough. So her cough increased significantly. That's clear from this chart, but she and therefore her doctors were unaware of this. And we're getting data like this because we've partnered with a dozen research projects all over the world. These projects give us access to valuable data, and that's what makes our classifiers possible. We're new, but we're making a splash. 2020 was just the start. 2021 is going to be big for us. And the reason I say that with such confidence is because we've already built algorithms based on sound only, based on coughs, which can diagnose respiratory diseases with a pretty high degree of accuracy. So on behalf of the Hype team, thanks so much for your attention. Great, and thank you to the Hype team. Up next, we have Buddy AI, a provider of clinical and revenue cycle automation solutions for healthcare companies. So take it away, Buddy AI. Hello, my name is Ram Swaminathan. I'm actually here to present Buddy AI. Buddy AI is a deep learning platform for healthcare. We are a cloud-based revenue cycle automation leader, deploying deep learning algorithms to streamline healthcare inefficiencies, pervasive within providers, payers, and pharma workflows. If you look at the core reason why we started the company, look at the annual you know, wastage in billing and coding. It's north of $265 billion being spent. 42% uh, of the physicians 
you know, uh, uh, cry out loud on the stress they have on the administrative burden that they have in documentation. And 60, 70, 80 percent of the data is unstructured. Uh, 34 percent of the denials are attributed due to erroneous coding. $25 on every claim which is reworked um, is the is the cost that uh, providers actually spend. You know, on on the same dollars they're going to get, they spend more and more dollars because of their denials on the rework. And almost two days in a week is spent on uh, prior auth. And what we've actually d understood is there's a huge concern on documentation, you know, which is actually not kosher for coding, uh, compliant for coding. Medical coding is highly laborious, you know, uh, inaccurate and very complex. Um, medical billing is inaccurate and it, it comes with a lot of rework and it involves a lot of manual labor. And the new value based care model involves a lot of complex analysis, risk adjustment, which, which requires again reading unstructured data. In comes Buddy. We are actually using deep learning models to automate coding, calling autonomous coding, bringing in autonomous billing, and bringing in real time CDI approach to help physicians rectify the documentation in real time versus after the fact. And then the whole system is actually empowered by the contextual lake platform that you see on the bottom here. Now, contextual lake is essentially a way by which you can, you know, uh, realize the context of the data versus actually just the data. Now, to put it in perspective, in the last, uh, you know, couple of decades, uh, we're familiar with data warehousing. When data, you know, couldn't be warehoused, they came up with the phrase of data lake. But then, if when you build in containers, and containers of data. The context is missing. What we have really brought into healthcare is a context driven automation so that we can mine the context from a medical record, from a payer contract, from a claims data, and EOB data, and use that context for automation. If I were to quickly get to a demo here, you can, you can see how this entire medical record, if you look at the, the unstructured nature of the medical record of the ED setting, you have a chief complaint, shortness of breath, the patient is treated for upper respiratory tract infection. So you have an ED note here, which basically gets translated into NLP and tagged NLP here. Every word, every phrase has been annotated and, and, and clearly understood, and then we create a graph. The graph is essentially the context, so we clearly understand from paragraphs, it goes into essentially clear context, and that context drives automation. Now, as as we all know, the the goal of actually you know healthcare is getting into reducing cost thanks to the pandemic of the kind of actually stress the financial stress the hospitals have gone through. What Buddy is going through is essentially a, a renaissance of change, bringing in accuracy guarantees for hospitals, bringing in volume automation guarantees. We are actually automating north of 2.454 million charts a month, and our goal is to actually touch. 150 you know million dollar revenue ARR by 2025 and we are raising a 50 mil series A round and again my name is Ram Swaminathan and you can reach me at rs at buddy.ai and thanks for the opportunity. Wonderful. Thank you to the Buddy AI team. So up next, we have Brilliant MD, who provides transparency to healthcare data, increased revenue in the claims process, and transforms data-driven decisions and insights. So welcome, Brilliant MD. Hello, my name is Ryan, and I'm the CEO of Brilliant MD. Healthcare billing in the US is a mess. It's inefficient, and every year there are billions of dollars left on the table. About 10% of all healthcare claims get initially denied. It's over $200 billion annually. And half of these don't even get looked at by the healthcare providers. It's not necessarily because they should not get paid for these, but it's because organizations just don't have the time or resources to thoroughly address all these denials. And if inefficiencies in this process that causes have been an issue in healthcare billing for a very long time. And though there have been some great solutions implemented that have helped improve the process, most of these are rule-based or require a significant amount of man hours. And there's clearly a lot of money still left on the table. BrilliantMD implements AI and blockchain solutions into healthcare billing workflows to increase revenue cycle management efficiencies, transparency, and to maximize payer payments to healthcare providers. 
This platform that we're creating is bucketed into three different areas. The first one we developed on the far right was in the post-denial space, where you, we use our machine learning models to prioritize and give insights to revenue cycle teams to maximize revenue from already denied claims. The middle bucket focuses on pre-denials. How can we utilize these same machine learning models and natural language processing technologies to predict and prevent claim denials before they even happen? And finally, that first bucket on the, on the left is utilizing our AI solutions to give recommendations in patient care situations in a way that provides recommendations to the most cost-effective approaches for both the patients and providers. And all of this sits on our blockchain-driven incentivization and transactional framework. And this isn't just a theoretical product and platform. Our first part of this platform actually went live at the end of 2019 with a large post-acute care organization that handles over a billion dollars in claims every year. After implementing our solution into their claim denial process, they saw a 28% increase in revenue per claim worked. And this isn't the only traction that we've seen. Over the past two years, we've seen a lot of growth, including being part of the Dell Medical School Incubator, being awarded the National Science Foundation grant, our first three contracts, which ended up with us being profitable last year with over half a million in revenue. And we obviously couldn't have done this without an all-star team and advisor support. Our team has years of startup, AI, blockchain, and healthcare experience. We've been leaders in academics and AI and blockchain. We have executive experience with billion dollar healthcare organizations and multiple startup successes. So what is next? Well, now that our company uh, is at a place where we have customers and we have the team that can really do this and the traction, we're really looking to put fuel on the fire and bring on our next batch of customers. We're very confident in our ability to do this. So that's why we offer with just six to 12 months of non-PHI data, we can run our solution and show potential upside and insights at no cost and no strings attached to potential customers. Um, just because we believe that uh, at Brilliant MD, we can uh, save and provide billions of dollars of benefit to healthcare providers and that we can use AI and blockchain to bring clarity to the confusion of healthcare billing for all. Uh, thank you for your time and open for any questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Ryan and the Brilliant MD team. So up next, we have Adam Beam, which is a data reduction solution that reduces IoT and machine data while enhancing security. So take it away, Adam Beam. Hi, I'm Charles Yeomans. So I'm Adam Beam CEO. Since Adam Beam was founded in 2017, we've raised about 3 million and we've been issued seven patents. We have a product that's in production and we have contracts with the Air Force and the Navy. Along with plug and play, we're a Stanford StartX Accelerator member. We address two critical issues in data generation. IoT or machine data is growing at an exponential rate and security for that data is a big problem. So what do we do? We're applying an old technique, the use of code books, but we're doing it in a completely new way. We use machine learning and the very latest math and computer science techniques to make this old idea into something very powerful. Our software technology makes IoT and medical data faster, smaller, and more secure. This slide gives you a sense of how well this works. Atom Beam has an impact on IoT that far exceeds compression or any other technology. We effectively expand bandwidth by a factor of four times, substituting for billions in hardware investment. Other benefits include searchability and random access to stored files. You can't do that with compressed data. And for genomic data, it opens up major research opportunities. Other key benefits include added security, longer battery life, dramatically lower storage costs, and extended range. Atom Beam is a very horizontal technology. Because it operates at the bit level, we can address any kind of data that has patterns. Verticals include smart manufacturing, buildings and cities, telematics, medical, defense, and more. Now onto our traction. Our customers are either big end users or companies that make devices that are sold to their customers. LG, Ford, Proterra, Schneider Electric, Caterpillar, and several SMBs are engaged, and in many cases have completed successfully POCs with Atom Beam. Now here are the economics for one successful ongoing pilot for a truck oil fleet. 
we will save them about a million a year in satellite data costs. Our go-to-market looks to exploit our massive opportunity to scale. Big end users can incorporate our technology to solve problems in autonomous cars and other applications. Satellite companies need ways to lower connectivity costs and latency for prospects and cloud service providers are seeking competitive advantage. These partners can influence IoT and medical device makers to incorporate a free AtomBeam client. When the Atom end user activates AtomBeam, the partner builds the end user and AtomBeam receives its cut of the fee. The end users get a big discount on connectivity, faster data, and more security and so forth. The satellite operator gets a customer who can now afford their service, and the cloud service provider has new revenue generating service that offers big advantages for their end user customer. Everybody wins, and AtomBeam scales fast. Eventually, AtomBeam will just be a check the box option for end users that radically increases their efficiency. Our competition is hardware expansion of bandwidth and edge computing, but AtomBeam can still be complementary to any of these technologies. We have a deeply experienced and qualified team. This is my third CEO job and everybody else here knows their business. We'll be looking for another million this year to ramp operations and we plan to raise an A round early next year. AtomBeam is a revolutionary technology software that takes the place of billions of heart dollars in hardware and some very important benefits. We are a major factor in machine data networks and for medical technology. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Charles and the Adam Beam team. So last but certainly not least, we have the last startup. We have Leah Levine presenting on behalf of Mechanomind, an AI image recognition, recognition solution for cancer diagnostics. So take it away, Leah. Hello, everyone. I'm a co-founder at Mechanomind. We are an artificial intelligence company applying computer vision and deep learning to diagnostics of cancer. Each of us has 50% chance to develop cancer in our lifetime. But not everybody knows how cancer is really diagnosed. That it's not a quantitative test, but a person analyzing visual patterns in biopsy tissue. Decision-making is subjective and prone to errors. While number of biopsies growing because of people living longer, available screening and early detection, the number of pathologists is actually declining. As a result, we have three glaring problems. Access. The shortage of pathologists is severe and growing. Low-income countries have the highest shortage, sometimes even not estimated because patients aren't identified, just dying from undiagnosed cancer. Another problem is accuracy. Every fifth patient is at risk. And finally, we have delays that lead to more aggressive treatment or incurability. What if we could automate diagnostics of standard cases that occupy 80% of pathologists' time and leave difficult ones to scarce pathologists? What if we could redistribute cases among all of them so altogether they could much more efficiently diagnose the current 1 billion cases a year? What if we could introduce a low-cost diagnostic solution to developing countries, help them to address undiagnosed cancer and save millions of lives? We can make pathology diagnosis a commodity, fast, accurate, and accessible to everyone. That's what we do. We started with dermatopathology. This is the practice with the biggest volumes, highest share of benign cases that occupy pathologists' time, highest disagreement among pathologists because some skin tumors are particularly tricky, especially when it comes to melanoma, one of the most deadliest cancers that can progress quickly. We developed an expert-level algorithm that can recognize 40 skin tumor types, including all common malignancies. The algorithm works with digitized images of pathology slides from all modern scanners, doesn't require additional stains, patient or clinical information. Algorithm is deployed in a secure cloud, and currently we offer it as a diagnostic support tool. FDA exempted our solution class from the need to get 510k clearance. We had an independent validation at the University of Chicago Medicine. The study was designed to address the real-world pathology environment, including various populations, most difficult and most common diagnoses, and all kinds of artifacts and images. Despite all those complications, the recognition accuracy was clinical grade. Today, labs can use our solution as a second reading to increase accuracy, as quality control tool 
as a triage to distribute cases between pathologists with different levels of expertise. So to balance workloads, prioritize daily tasks, unburden senior pathologists from reviewing simple cases and stop being bottlenecks, involve general pathologists into reviewing simple specialized cases and increase lab capacity. Triage also enables efficient outsourcing and remote work. The future of cancer diagnostics will be a global network of digitized labs using AI for work assignment and quality control. More and more diagnoses will be signed out by AI alone, and only non-standard ones will be signed out by pathologists. And Mechanomind is the only company with an automated diagnosis kind of solution. Our business model is a subscription service of pathology labs and marketplace for pathology services that will allow placing orders to the most suitable pathologists available on the global market. We are fundraising for pilots, platform development and integrations. Thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you, Leah and the MechanoMind team. So that brings us to the end of our 20 startup pitches. Before we head into our corporate award winner and announcing that, you'll see a poll pop up to vote for your favorite startup. So go ahead and vote for your favorite company. And we'll be announcing that on our social media channels very soon. So while you're filling out that poll, I will pass it to my colleague, Jennifer, to announce our corporate innovation award winner. Thank you, Ava. So happy to do so. Um, so um, everyone, it's uh, really now my honor to announce the Corporate Innovation Award winner. Uh, and this year, it's going to be our longtime partner, University Hospitals, located in Cleveland, Ohio. So Plug and Play makes this distinct recognition to our partner corporations that have demonstrated a commitment to expanding their innovation culture by developing partnerships with startups, building networks with peers and across industry and through their thought leadership, you know, really engaging with the plug and play ecosystem. And during the past challenging year, University Hospitals Ventures, which is the venture arm of University Hospitals that we work with, continue to take full advantage of plug and play health ecosystem. And, you know, even in tough times for hospitals, they had the foresight that now more than ever, a hospital must foster innovation, drive investment, bring technology to market faster. Um, and frankly, we've been impressed by their determination to lead on innovation and their, ability, and their ability, excuse me, to engage in many topic areas and across industry to get it done. So let me introduce David Sylvan. He's the president of UH Ventures. And in his role, David has a portfolio of responsibilities, including core operations, industry partnerships, tech transfer, commercialization, business development, and strategic initiatives runs a wonderful shop. Welcome, David. We so enjoy working with you and your talented team. Hey, everyone. Great to see everyone at the uh, Plug and Play Summer Summit 2021. Um, we are very humbled to acknowledge uh, being named as the Health Corporate Innovation Awardee for this summit. When the impact of the pandemic became clear, our system initiated a very effective aligned response that ensured that that our system would could quickly react to a rapidly changing set of variables but we also learned that leveraging intellectual assets non-traditional relationships these all helped us to innovate in ways that we never imagined possible in order to rapidly address a number of unmet needs uh, our partnership with play is critical to that they're outstanding collaborators not only throughout the pandemic but uh, pre and post uh, and we continue to work together to make cleveland a thriving innovation hub for uh, plug and play to be our lens on the depth and the breadth of novel innovation both domestically and internationally and we look forward to the continued impact that we can in partnership have for our patients for our communities and for our populations once again, from University Hospitals and University Hospitals Ventures, thank you, Plug and Play. Wonderful, and thank you again to the University Hospitals team and congratulations. Um, so just a few things before we head into the networking portion of our event. We didn't have a live Q&A today, but we do encourage you to contact the startups directly 
on Attendify if you have any questions or would like to connect with them. So on the left hand side of your screen, you'll see an icon titled Startup Boots. So if there's a startup that ignites your interest or you simply would like to learn more about that startup that you saw today, here you'll find additional information as well as the contact information for their team. If you'd like to video chat with them on demand, you can use the Meet Now feature, which you'll see highlighted in a red box. Um, you'll see a green dot by the startup booth if the startups are in their booths and ready to meet with you. So at this point, we'll be opening the floor for networking. As I've mentioned before, please feel free to jump between the startup booths and connect with other members of the audience using the Meet Now features. So thank you again for everyone for joining us today. A big, big thank you to our partners and our startups for another incredible program. We're very excited to kick off our fall program in September. So stay tuned for those announcements that are coming in a few months. Thank you all again, and we'll see you in the startup booths. Take care, everyone. How do you track your team's innovation efforts? However that is, we've got an easier way. Let us introduce Playbook. Playbook is Plug and Play's innovation software. It is an exclusive tool only available for our ecosystem's corporate partners. With it, you and your team will be able to browse your curated startups database, create, discover, and rate lists of startups, track your engagement, pilots, and investments, analyze data from the tech ecosystem, Organize private sessions with select startups, and so much more. Hundreds of corporations count on Playbook to empower their innovation journey. Get in touch to start using Playbook today.